I'd like to ask um, Siobhan Pyburn of the founder of the BEAM project a couple of things, please, if I may. Your organisation, the BEAM project, provides training for frontline staff, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And that's in relation to disclosure of child sexual abuse and how it's handled? Yeah, we focus on the reasons why children find it so difficult to tell someone, how we can have the kind of conversations to help them, and how to respond to disclosures. Right. And is it your experience, is it something that frontline professionals feel equipped to do, to deal with that kind of thing or not? They're not really sure exactly what their obligations are half the time. I think the policy is very nebulous, particularly in this country. There's all different obligations for different groups of professionals. Um, yeah, so often that they're, they're not entirely sure, but they all say that if they would come to know of abuse, then of course they would report it. And many of them are surprised to hear that there's no legal obligation to do so. In fact, sometimes I've had people insist that we already have mandatory reporting, and it's all very confusing. If the current arrangements are enough, then why are we... Why are we all here right now? Time and again, the serious case reviews demonstrate a need for must rather than musts that are actually backed by law rather than all this coulda, shoulda, woulda stuff. Hillside First School, South Bank School, Rotherham, no one can say we didn't know. Wasn't that one of the concluding remarks from the report written by Professor Jay over there, who I totally cited in the dissertation that I did actually write on this subject? So my position is to follow the evidence, even if it goes against my lived experience. I think a willingness to change our mind when presented with new information is extremely crucial. Otherwise, it's all a big waste of time. However, on this occasion, the evidence is in alignment with my experience. We already know from the research mentioned by Mandate Now earlier that mandatory reporting increases substantiated reporting where abuse is happening um, we already know that before that study came out, and it was quite a substantial piece of work covering seven years. I think it was three years before and four years after, or four years before and three years after, the introduction of mandatory reporting in Western Australia. Before that came out, there was a lot of arm-waving with people from both sides of the debate saying things that wasn't actually grounded on evidence, but now we have some. As for my personal experience, I do know that there were times where a teacher could have done something but didn't. One day at school, a teacher noticed that I had been acting strangely and she asked me what was wrong. I said I didn't want to go home that, that evening. Why not? Because I'll be alone with my father. Why is that a problem? And then I became upset and said there was a secret and I mustn't tell anyone. Hopefully everyone in this room can see all the red flags coming off there. But my teacher didn't do anything. I don't actually remember this conversation taking place because as far as I'm concerned, I did my best to keep it a secret because I thought that I would go to prison. So how do I know that this conversation even happened? Because that teacher found out about the work that I'm doing now and messaged me years later to confess her failure to take action. She said, and I quote, back then there was no referral system and I didn't feel it was my place to intervene, to which I would ask if it wasn't her place, then whose place was it? She mentions that there was no referral system back then, but as far as I can tell, nothing has actually changed in that regard. Professionals can still choose to turn a blind eye if they're afraid of dropping themselves in it or threatening the institution's reputation or whatever. It's plausible that if reporting laws had existed in this country at that time, then my teacher would have known how to respond to this situation. She could have recorded her concerns and made a report, perhaps after speaking to me a few more times in order to encourage a full disclosure, but she didn't do anything. And this is not an isolated incident. We know from all the serious case review reviews that time and again professionals are coming up with signs, they are realising that something's wrong, but for whatever reason they're choosing not to report it. So I hope that I represent the other side of the voice of the child kind of argument because in my personal experience I disclosed because I wanted something to be done about it. I didn't tell someone and then hope that they wouldn't do anything. Well, I actually... Literally speaking, that's incorrect, because when I did finally disclose, I begged my mum not to tell anyone. So what do you think my mum should have done in that situation? Gone, oh, well, voice of the child, let's just not do anything. No, of course not. And I, I, she did do something. She told the police. And I'm so grateful that she did that, even though I begged her not to. So there's a limit to the whole voice of the child thing. 
My teacher clearly had suspicions, otherwise why get in touch years later? Some people say that mandatory reporting undermines professional decision-making, but I think it does the opposite. I think it reinforces decision-making by making everyone's responsibilities clear. One core component of reporting Liz reporting laws which don't appear on the briefing note is that they offer immunity to mandated reporters or anyone else making a report in good faith. The existing system doesn't do that. And it's a reasonable concern, I think, that a professional might be dissuaded from reporting out of a fear of whistleblowing repercussions, which we've heard a bit about today. Mandatory reporting bypasses that obstacle completely and introduces real accountability instead of just talking about it. Thanks. Oh, Siobhan Pyburn from Southampton was 17 when she started her campaign. Ten years later, she's one of the country's most prominent female activists, speaks at conferences and trains professionals.